Have I discovered the perfect sword? Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatore. Now, often when I compare and contrast different sword designs, particularly in the post-medieval era, we're looking at hand protection versus weight versus um, dexterity, how much you can uh, sort of manipulate the weapon, how many different ways you can hold it relative to how much hand protection. So when we're talking about something with no hand protection at all, obviously the hand is vulnerable. When we're talking about something like a, a saber guard, just grab a, a typical saber for you, that's, um, you know, that's quite a lot of hand protection, but it's still a compromise, the sides are open. Um, when we're talking talking about something like a rapier hilt, for example, it might protect the front of your hand, but not necessarily the sides of it. When we're talking about something like a basket hilt, where then there's more weight, there's more mass in the hilt, but it protects your hand incredibly, but it might inhibit the movement of your uh, hand and in some cases wrist um, in manipulating the sword. So in lots of videos, I've made a point that I really like saber hilts uh, and things similar to saber hilts. I like rapier hilts as well, because they're a good middle ground between not inhibiting your hand too much. Um, so still leaving you with a lot of dexterity, and with minimum um, sacrifice to protection. But they do have gaps, and it has to be said, I've got a sword that I'm about to show you, and I'm just gonna put it over here for a second. It has to be said, with a typical 19th century saber hilt such as that, it does offer a real good practical sense of protection. Um, without really inhibiting you at all in terms of how you use the weapon or even wear it. A basket hilt's quite difficult to wear. When we look at something like, this is the uh, Kvetan Eastern Sabre Mark III. Um, so this has got a bowl, a symmetrical bowl hilt. That's a little bit tricky to wear. It gets a little bit in the way, but it's got a buttload of hand protection. And honestly, we don't get hit ha in the hand in sparring very much at all with those hilts. They are good protection. But we have to concede a full basket hilt does offer more hand protection. And not only more hand protection, it actually offers quite a lot of protection to the forearm. It's quite difficult to get to someone's sword arm when they've got a bloody great basket hilt. So wouldn't it be nice if you had the protection or uh, protectiveness of a basket hilt, but with all of the freedom of movement of a saber hilt? Well, folks, I think I've found it. And here it is. I'm gonna show you the hilt first. We'll talk about the blade in a bit. And here is the hilt. It is a regulation pattern. Not only that, it's a regular regulation pattern which was actually emulated by at least two, um, or certainly at least one, non-regulation Victorian officer's sword, which I have an article about on the Eastern Antique Arms website, linked below, incidentally. But what is this? So for those of you who don't already know, this is the 1788 heavy, um, cavalry sword okay so it's the heavy cavalry um officer's sword for uh, or is it trooper sword no it's a it's a trooper sword sorry it's the heavy cavalry trooper sword of 1788 um and that's what it is. And it's a basket hilt, yeah? So it's a basket hilt that's symmetrical. A left-handed or right-handed person could use it equally. It's equi-balanced, so it doesn't, it's not heavier on one side than the other, which has other advantages. Yeah, it's, it's relatively big, it's relatively heavy, it's not particularly easy to wear, but it gives you almost as much protection as a full Highland basket hilt, but it has an important detail to it. Notice that the knuckle bow element, the central element here, joins at only one point of the pommel. There are no sidebars joining at the side of the pommel, as you would find with a typical basket hilt. This means that you're able to fully extend the hand forward and put your thumb up the back exactly like you do with a saber. You can do all exactly the same ways of gripping, exactly the same ways of cutting and moving with this sword as you can do with a saber hilt, because the only um, obstruction, the only contact point between this and the back end of the sword, the pommel, is at that front. Now before I go on and we look at the actual uh, sort of mobility and uh, freedom of movement that this type of hilt offers, 
let's have a look at the blade because the blade's worth talking about as well. Not only is this hilt fantastic, but the blade's amazing. Now the blade, again, was copied by at least three known, and again, there's an article about this on the Eastern Antique Arms uh, sort of research section. Um, this was copied by at least three known swords that were made as a special order from Wilkinson in the 19th century. So they kind of revived this design. Now, what's so good about it? Well, fundamentally, it's a back sword, okay? So um, for the first half of the blade, from there to there, it is a back sword blade with, as you'll notice, it's got double fullers, okay? Nothing particularly exciting to mention about that, but from the um, middle of the blade right the way to the tip, it's now essentially a broadsword blade. It's a double-edged blade. It's kind of like a spadroon. Um, more, it's broader than a spadroon. It's more like a side sword blade, actually. It's broader than most rapiers, broader than most spadroons. Not quite as broad as most Highland broadswords. It is uh, tapered and it tapers pretty much regularly from the, the base all the way down to the tip. Um, but it is double-edged. Now, why is it good that it's double-edged? Well, fundamentally, it means that you quite, it's got quite a light tip of the blade, so it's got a very strong base of the blade, which you want for defending and parrying and gives you a very stiff fort or strong of the blade. And then the tip of the blade is fantastic for piercing, fan fantastic for thrusting. It's a symmetrical point, double-edged, so it's going to go straight through things very, very easily. But you've also got the potential of a sharp false edge or back edge for those kind of cuts and it also means you've got very little resistance going cutting through targets as well. So it's a really interesting design. It's, it's a back sword and it's a narrow broadsword. <laughs> um, and it's big. How big is it? So let's get my tape measure out quickly. I can't actually remember if I've measured this but I can tell you it's long and it's longer than most of the sabres I've got here. So it's 30 eight inches that's pr that's pretty long okay so the um light's not hanging up at the moment <laughs> i'm used to it being there but the french uh the standard french 1822 cavalry saber has a 36 inch blade which is pretty long the british standard is 35 and a half inches and those are cavalry swords this is a cavalry sword so so sort of 35 and a half 36 inches those are pretty long uh the lifeguards sometimes have up to 39, 40 inches, but this is a 38 inch blade. So it's not colossally unwieldy. Um, and we'll look at that in a second, but man, this thing's long. Um, and certainly for a cut and thrust sword, this thing's big. I mean, look how big this thing is. I'll just grab a, uh, this is a officer's, um, officer's uh, saber here of standard sort of Victorian size and proportions and you can see that it's a it's got quite a good bit of extra length compared to the standard um, officer's saber so it's a big sword but it feels really for its length really nimble in the hands you've got a huge amount of length on it because of the way that the blade tapers and the fact that it becomes double-edged towards the tip and that massive basket hilt so i hope you can see now that you can you can move this whopping great massive sword pretty damn quickly uh, all the way around i can put the thumb up i have to say it's not particularly comfortable uh, the grip's a little bit slippy um, to put your thumb up here and because of the size of the sword I prefer to use a kind of handshake or hammer fist uh, grip on this but man this sword moves absolutely beautifully and the amount of hand protection that you've got on this thing it's almost as much as a Highland basket hilt but without impeding the hand at all. Now drawbacks so it's a big sword it's a fairly heavy sword. Those are drawbacks potentially. It being symmetrical, it's not going to be particularly easy to wear <laughs> and you've got that extra weight there as a result. Okay, so those are potential disadvantages. But once you're in actual combat, I think you'd be quite happy with this sword. And to be honest, they never should have replaced this. I mean, what were they thinking about with the 1796 heavy cavalry sword? They must have been really peeved when they had to replace they're 1788s with the 1796 Heavy Palash, uh, which is modelled on the 1769 Austrian Palash. And you know, sometimes it's a good example of sometimes militaries and governments, they just want to change because they want something that looks more modern, they want something that looks more up to date. This looks like an 18th century backsword. The 1796 Palash looks like a new type of sword and the Austro-Hungarian cavalry was very fashionable and they wanted to emulate it. So I, I can see why it happened, 
but there must have been people who were really not happy that it happened. And if I had to go into combat in the early parts of the Napoleonic Wars in the 1790s, um, well, once the 1796 came in, so from 1796 through to 1800, and I had to do it with the 1796 Palash, but I'd formerly been familiar with this sword, I would not have been happy about it. This is a longer blade, it's got a better point for thrusting. I mean, they had to grind the points down on those 1796 heavies um, to make them more effective for thrusting because the hatchet point was completely unsuited for thrusting. Um, so this is better for thrusting. It's a longer blade. You've got greater reach. I suspect that this will actually cut better uh, because of the momentum you can get into that tip. Um, it's got way better hand protection. It looks cooler. Um, it just handles more nicely, but sometimes things come down to fashion. And at the end of the day, with its uh, backsword style basket hilt, and um, with its backsword style blade, and its separate pommel, I guess they probably looked at it and went, oh, that sword's so old fashioned now, it's time to replace it. Damn progress. They should have kept this sword. What an absolutely fantastic model of sword. And if this had still been the heavy cavalry sword throughout the 19th century, possibly into the 20th century, it would have been fine. It would have absolutely done the job and they wouldn't have to have gone through all of those other patterns. What a fantastic sword. As you can probably tell, I'm a fan. Anyway, uh, post your comments and thoughts below. Do you think it looks cool? Do you think it's brilliant? Do you think they should have stuck with it? Or do you think I'm wrong and that they were right to introduce the 1796 heavy cavalry palash? Really? If you do, I'd be interested to hear your reasons. But what a fantastic sword. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon on the channel. And give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.